What does IATF mean to me? It's a family. It's networking. It's catching up with colleagues. It's, it's discussing ideas. And you go away and you feel inspired. That's ITFL is a teacher's empowerment. Like very intense, so I can um, gain much knowledge from the speaker. ITFL is a great networking opportunity. Very, very wonderful. I've really met a lot of intellectuals and it's really a wonderful experience. And ITFL is a very good platform for teachers. ITFL is very wonderful. It's inspiring. Uh, it's like a paradise for teachers. Yeah. And influential. A lot of new ideas. A great place to meet up with people, people you've known for t some time, people you meet online, and old friends. Amazing and astonishing. It's a, a life exchange of experience. Thank you, Ike, for that. I think uh, English is becoming the lingua franca. Everyone wants to speak English. Everyone wants to learn English. It's going to be more uh, clear and also combination with um, of technology. For me, it's AI and when will the robots take over? What's our role? Fascinating. Very relevant in the future is that we will have to talk about Englishes. So not one version of language to be taught, not the proper English. And for me, it's how do we start teaching the other six billion people in the world who don't have access to nice language schools and wonderful computers and AI. English for the underserved, low technology and people without electricity. Those are the people we should be helping with radio, for example. It will no longer be a language lesson, but it will be a mean or, or the means to study many other subjects across the curriculum. So it's going to be really important and every, all teachers and every teacher will consider that English is the most important subject for all. For all. The future direction for ELT is online English language teaching and also online material. So maybe publish a need to talk about artificial uh, intelligence and uh, virtual reality, things like that. Um, English has become a global language and uh, it's also a linked language. So yes, in future, um, it's going to grow and ITFL is a very good platform where everyone uh, gets to know what is going on uh, as far as ELT is concerned. So it's going to go more global and more global. You get different educators coming together, basically brainstorming, learning things together, coming up with ideas, connecting. And really, this, this, this is the future of English teaching because now you could just go to these conferences, learn so much, 
um, go back to your uh, perhaps institute or your students just a better teacher with, with so many more ideas that you can implement in your teaching. Not only that, but rather ideas you can research more and perhaps offer something back to the community so that other people could benefit as well. So welcome everybody to this year's closing plenary. And I'm sorry that it's me on stage doing the introduction again, but all day. Um, so welcome to the plenary. Like language teaching itself, IATEFL is always looking to innovate. And the innovation we chose for this year was to add a future direction strand to the conference. And this closing plenary the, with the panel is the culmination of that. If you had studied the program assiduously over the last few days, you will notice there were at least 25 talks all tagged with the possibility of a future direction. And these are just some of the titles of those talks. You can see everything from storytelling to older learners, to equality, to EMI, to robots, to authentic materials, to discovery learning. So clearly, there's a lot of opinions as to what a future or the future direction of ELT might be. In addition to the strand, we, um, some weeks ago, started on social media asking the audience, or the potential audience, what you thought the, um, the future might be, and we're going to feed those questions in during this plenary. Obviously, we can't cover all these things over the next 50 minutes or so, so we made a decision before conference started to choose four areas. We're going to look at materials, we're going to look at uh, workplace English, we're going to look a little bit about students of the future, and then culminate looking at the role of the teacher possibly in the future. Having chosen those four areas, we asked four experts to come and join us, to consider their past and their present, and give to us in a very short presentation what they think a prediction, a wish, a hope, and perhaps even a fear for the future of ELT. In turn, I'm going to ask each to come to the stage. They represent four different contexts, four different types of teachers, four different um, um, places and contexts of work. So hopefully it will give us an inter a very interactive view of what they think the future might be. So in turn, they'll come to the stage, they'll speak for four or five minutes after four or five minutes, sorry, Mercedes, five or six minutes. <laughs> uh, and once they've finished, I'll follow up with a couple of questions from the, those that you've already submitted. If you want to continue to submit questions, and I can't promise we'll get them all, you can, of course, use the Future Directions hashtag. And I'm going to be checking Twitter primarily to see if there are any more questions coming up. OK? So after they've all finished, or after they finish their turn, We'll hand over to you. Don't panic. We're not going to drag you on stage. Um, what we'd like you to do is, using the technology that you have available, we'll put a poll on the screen. And whether you're on a tablet, a phone, or a computer, you can join in on that poll. And if the technology works, we should get an opinion both in the room and, of course, those of you joining us online. Okay? And you'll see the, uh, the, the, the URL for that as we go through it. Then, once they've all finished speaking, if there is time left, We'll throw it open to questions from the floor. There are microphones there and there, and also <coughs> to social media. Got it? So let's get going. Our first speaker, oh, look, I forgot the slides of what's happening. There you go. See, we've had questions on social media, <laughs> and we've had questions on the floor. So our first speaker who is going to talk about materials is Catherine Billsborough. If you don't know Catherine, of course, she is a wonderful materials writer, course book writer. And uh, on top of that, one of the reasons we asked her here, here is because she really is interested in trying to push the principles of ELT writing and what goes into it. So, Catherine, over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Have you had a good conference? Okay. <laughs> Okay, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, closing plenary. And thanks to all of you sitting there for staying for this closing plenary. We all really appreciate it because we know that sometimes people have to hurry away 
um, and get back to their jobs and their families, etc. So today we are talking about, as Sean said, our predictions and wishes for the future, but they're two very different things. And I've decided to speak, uh, to choose my wishes for the future. Um, I'm going to show you, give you five of my wishes for the future related to materials. I've chosen wishes because I'm naturally uh, a quite an optimistic person. And as the Uruguayan author, Eduardo Galeano said, let's save pessimism for better times. <laughs> and I'm focusing on um, the end users of materials because I care about them, because I am producing materials for people who I don't know and um, who will be using them in the future and might not yet even be born. So I'd like to make five points. Um, there are a lot of materials out there, more and more. It's overwhelming. These days, we can find materials about almost anything. We've got the traditional materials from the publishers, and then we've got more and more self-published materials and materials that teachers create and share online, etc. And lots of it is excellent and some of it is very good. But quite frankly, some of it leaves a lot to be desired. And this is something I really care about because sometimes when, te when teachers are selecting materials, they might not be able to evaluate. They might not have the skills to evaluate these materials. So I'd really like to see more rigor and more quality control in future materials. One way I think we can do this is by providing more training in teacher training programs, etc., in evaluation of materials and materials design but especially getting together and working together and thinking about what materials need to be like. So that's my main first point. These are in no particular order, by the way. <clears throat> this is a big one for me. Um, and I know that some people out there work in exams. There would be people who make their living working in exams. I've been a YL examiner too myself, okay? Um, I really believe that we should, there should be far less exams dominant in our materials, but especially in young learners' materials. I, I create most of my materials, my materials are for young learners. And I'm fed up, I am sick and tired of being told that my materials need to align so closely with the exams for five and six year olds and seven and eight year olds. I find it restrictive and I find it ridiculous. And in actual fact, when we are told that we must align uh, vocabulary lists, etc., from various exam syndicates to the materials, um, I've been told, on, and I have it on good authority, that those lists were never designed for that purpose. And I'd really like to move away from that in materials. I do realize there's a place for exams, of course, but I do think that they can be done in a better way. And I mean, in my ideal world, there would be no exams for children. But I am optimistic, but I'm not a fool. My clicker's not, wow. Oh, sorry. I'm, okay. Um, my next point is um, everybody here knows that the world is divided into the haves and the have-nots. Okay? That's a simple way of putting it. And I am absolutely convinced without a shadow of a doubt that every single person in this room will agree with what I'm about to say. That isn't fair. Okay? We know this isn't fair. And when it comes to materials, I really do get quite upset when I see that some of my materials are being used in classrooms with privileged children. But in lots of parts of the world, they aren't being used because people can't afford to buy the materials. 
Now, I know this is a big one, but I really believe that if we all work together, and that's my main message today, I think, we need to work together and get rid of all the us and them nonsenses. Can we say nonsenses as plural? <clears throat> but I think there is a way, there are ways that we can provide good materials for everyone everywhere, no matter how much money they have. There have to be ways. And if there aren't ways, we need to be creative and find ways. No teacher, absolutely no teacher, should be prevented from using good quality materials because of money. OK, my fourth point um, is that I, Sometimes, sometimes we talk about controversial topics and whether we should have them in course books, etc., etc. And people are divided, and, and people agree on certain topics, and people disagree, and then they might agree on other topics. But I believe firmly that every, every controversial topic, for every controversial topic that is needed by a teacher, and their students in any particular context, those materials need to be available. We need to create them. They need to be there. You might choose not to use them. That's up to you. You might disagree with them. That's up to you as well. But they need to exist. They need to exist, and they need to exist in places where we all know where to look for them. This is a poster from a Basque government campaign, by the way. Um, and the campaign was all about allowing women to dress the way they want to dress and to wear the clothes they want to wear and to be who they want to be. I think it's a fantastic image. But these materials need to exist. My final point, and it's related to, to the previous point, uh, and this has come up several times um, this week, in fact. Uh, one thing, just before I make this point, I've been delighted to see that many of the things I'm saying now have been confirmed by people speaking at this event. So we've had John Gray's Amazing Plenary, Tyson Seaborn did a wonderful workshop, David Vallon did a great workshop, James and Ila have, to, have brought out a book. James is sitting over there, that's why I'm looking that way, that address these themes. And it's wonderful, it's confirming. It's, it, it makes me feel more confident saying what I'm saying. So I think that um, learners, and again, I'm thinking especially of young learners because that's who I mainly work with, they should be able to see themselves in their materials and their own realities. Why can't they? A lot of work has been done and is being done, don't get me wrong, but a lot more needs to be done and a lot more ne needs to be done very quickly so that we can see people like Joseph in our materials and so that people like Eric here with his two dads are more visible. So I'm not sure if you share my opinions or not, my wishes, but these are my five main wishes for the future. Thank you. So, Kath, um, on, on the Facebook, when we put the question out on Facebook, and I do apologize if I mispronounce the person's name, Anne Met uh, Henri Henriksen said, uh, does more, uh, are e-books the way to get more customability and more personalization and more locality into Teaching. Okay, um, that's a good question, actually. I think ebooks are a fantastic way to be able to adapt materials and, and offer flexibility. But I just spoke about the haves and the have nots. And there are a lot of people who don't have access to ebooks or, or this kind of thing. I think the key word for me is flexibility in every context, in materials, in teaching, in learning, everything. So, yeah, let's. Try it in every single way and see what works. It kind of follows up with a number of people, and uh, obviously Lindsay alluded to this this morning as well. Does it really matter if things are online or on paper? Um, some people have preferences. 
Um, I actually said to uh, Mercedes this morning, here I'm, she was looking at her mobile to check what was happening today, and I, and I got my little piece of paper out with my, with my straw. So I, again, flexibility. One size does not fit all, ever. Okay, thank you. Thank Let's you. find out then. Uh, Catherine said, how many of, wishes, uh, of her wishes do you agree with? Let's find out. So this is the time when you can join in. If you've got a piece of technology at your hand, and of course if the Wi-Fi is working, if you open up your, uh, open up your browser and go to app.meet.ps, Catherine, okay, you will see the numbers one, two, three, four, and five. Catherine had five wishes. So how many do you agree with? Fingers crossed this works, eh? <laughs> <laughs> It'll come back up in a second. <laughs> Hang on. Hang on. Oh, it is working. So it's app.meeting. Uh, just to give you a heads up, all that's going to change over the next three polls is a name at the end. So you can get ready if you want. <laughs> All right, so let's have a look. Let's go back again and see if it works. 71% currently. Oh, oh, there we go. Folks are coming in. There you go. Ooh, ooh. And this is going to stay open. So if you can't vote now, you can vote uh, after the conference. You can even do it on your journey home or later on this week. We're going to keep it open for a while because this discussion, even though it's the plenary today, is going to go on beyond today. We are going to follow up with some articles uh, and some things on social media. So please uh, feel, keep, keep voting. So 71% at the moment. We'll come back later. But in the interest of time, let's move on from materials to English itself. And our next speaker, who is going to talk to us about the future of English in the workplace and how that might affect us, is Evan Frendo. Um, I'm sure many of you know Evan as the joint coordinator of BSIG, but um, apart from that, he is, of course, um, a very experienced and long-term corporate trainer. So, Evan, over to you, please, and give us your thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Sean. Um, of course, there are... There we go. It is, a bit, it is a bit clicky, this, isn't it? Um, there are so many different workplaces and workplace contexts that uh, what I thought I'd do in my five, six minutes is just focus in on two or three areas where I've been personally involved and where I can see some, I think, definite trends in where we're going and how, how uh, English is used in the workplace, um, how English will be used in the workplace. And then I'll finish off with just a couple of comments about what I think we might think about doing as teachers and trainers. Um, so, in Business English and ESP, we talk about service encounters. Service encounters are very, very common. It's a meet and greet situation in lots and lots of different um, contexts. It's where you go into a building, a government office, hospital, a shop. I met Pepper the robot personally in a shop in Japan, and he, she, it, we're not sure yet, uh, came up um, and started talking to me. And you can talk back. And this thing moves its arms and its eyes opens and close. You can go and Google it later if you haven't come across Pepper before. And it's quite interesting because it interacts with you on very simple things which its owner has programmed. So a shop can buy one of these machines and tailor make it to its own context. Hospital can do the same. A government office can do the same. This thing speaks up to 21 languages. And the translation comes via cloud. It's good. I mean, we all know how good some of this translation software has become. So this thing, in its own limited context, can actually communicate and can replace certain, certain types of jobs, perhaps. Um, I work in, um, on a project. I've been working on a project in South Korea for the last couple of years in uh, maritime, in the maritime industry. This is a VTS, Vessel Traffic Service, which is a bit like air traffic control. So this chap is sitting there, and he's watching ships coming in and out, and he's controlling the vessel traffic. And I've been working with a team, there's about 70 odd of us, and we've been um, building a big corpus of spoken conversations between ship and shore, and then analyzing it to see where the miscommunication is. And the idea was that we would analyze this, this stuff, look at the miscommunication, and that would then feed in into the materials which we use to train these people. Very simple. 
But what we found is about 95% of the conversations are routine. You know, where can I park my ship type question. And, and what, what's interesting about it is that very, very soon, we found that we don't need people to have this conversation with the vessels coming in and out of harbor. And there's a huge, if you're involved in maritime at all, there's a huge project going across, on right across the world, which is called e-navigation, e which is taking away the human part of all this communication. And so in the past, and at present, but not so much in the future, people will not be talking about these things. What they do have to talk about is the non-routine stuff, the difficult stuff, because that can't be done by AI, by machines yet. So if a vessel has an emergency, then that vessel needs to be able to communicate with somebody and sort it out. You know, uh, somebody's fallen off the ship, or, or a collision, or all, all the things which need immediate reaction, which you can't predict so easily. But that's only 5% of the, of the interactions and conversations. And this is actually quite challenging if you're training people to do this, because we don't have to focus on the easy stuff. We only have to focus on the relatively hard stuff. And of course, VTS communication, like any technical communication, like any workplace, ESP, uh, has very, very specialized way of speaking, uh, of communicating. It's a community of practice. In VTS, there are guidelines, rather like air traffic control, which which suggest what you should be able to say and how you should say things. So they don't use modals very much because you don't want any ambiguity to step into it. You can't say, can I do this? You just want instructions, do this, don't do this, etc. So they, like many, many workplace contexts, have their own specialized language. Um, I spend a lot of time in international meetings. Here I'm sitting, I'm the only teacher, I'm the only uh, native speaker, for want of a better word, I was just there as a consultant listening in on this meeting, and this meeting was full of people from all over the world. I don't think there was anybody from the same country. Uh, in, in the, and of course, it was English as a lingua franca. And English as a lingua franca is very, very common in business contexts like meetings. Um, we can discuss it and talk about it at conferences like this, but when you go into these meetings, it is happening. These people are using English at whatever level they have in order to get the job done. And so they're not worried about standard Englishes or standard this or standard that. That's not where they are. They're just getting the job done. And people come to these meetings quite often with very low uh, levels of English. This has always been a challenge, and, that, and that's fine. Um, but of course, nowadays, they come to these meetings with apps. They come to these meetings with telephones which speak to each other, with software on their laptops. And I've actually seen people in negotiations and so on who couldn't speak any English and they can communicate using these machines. And the naysayers have always said, yes, but they can't really, uh, there's not much sense and you're never quite sure. If you've got an engineer speaking to an engineer, they know when the machine's not making sense, generally. They are using this machine. We can say all we like in our own industry, but this is actually happening. People are using this sort of software all the time in companies across the world. So what? Well. I think this means that one of our very important tasks, which we haven't really been doing in our industry, our role is to help people understand and use this technology, not step away from it and say, I'm a teacher. I mean, I go into, I run courses for, for English for negotiations. The last one I was in, people said, I use my smartphone in my negotiation. Can you give me some tips on how best to use it in this context? And you know, they didn't do that on my teacher training course. So I think this is an area where teachers are really going to have to become focused if we're going to help our, our students, our learners. We're going to have to become very good at using this technology ourselves. Um, so that's one area I think our roles will change. The second thing, and this has been discussed at this conference, but it's happening more and more and more, is that our role is focusing a lot more on soft skills, on communication soft skills. So it's not so much the English training, uh, that we're, we're looking at, but it's the soft skills needed to communicate well in that particular context. So we're doing a lot of training, for example, in teaching people, if they have to do leadership talk, how do you persuade a group of people who are very busy and, and don't really have time and all the rest of it? How do you persuade them to do it? Those sorts of techniques. How do you uh, do impression management? Impression management is this idea that we create an impression when we meet somebody for the first time, we build credibility, uh, we influence the way they think about us. That's very, very important in a corporate sense, in, a, in any workplace. How, how do you make sure that uh, 
they have the skills to do that. And it's not only about English. How do you do teamwork? Virtual teamwork especially. This has become a huge challenge in international communication. Lots of people, lots of different contexts. The skills of actually doing that communication much more than perhaps just looking at narrowly in terms of language training. I'll finish off with a short, quick analogy. Calculator, some of the people in the audience are probably the, around the same age as me or even older. Um, and remember when calculators came in. And you remember the older generation saying, well, you shouldn't really use calculators because you're not learning how to count properly. You're not learning arithmetic. Um, your skills are being taken away. But what actually happened, of course, is that we didn't have to do the plussing and the, and the minusing, no, none of that, or the logs. You remember log tables, looking up log tables at school? We don't have to do that anymore because now, with a calculator, we can do maths. And we were doing seriously much more maths than we had ever done before when most of our time was spent doing plussing and minusing. And I think it's exactly the same with this. If our industry can work out how to use these tools in these certain situations where they're going to come in whatever we want, um, then I think we'll be helping our people to do a much, more, a much better job at communicating. And that, that's where we are, I think, in the future of the workplace, trying to get used to finding the best ways we can help people use this technology. Thank you very much. Look, I'm, I'm tempted to ask as the follow-up question is, what's a logbook, what did you say? Mm -hmm. um, however, I will go for the... Uh, <laughs> The, this question was submitted, so we had a, um, the tags in the, in the garden in, in the exhibition. And this question was submitted there, and I think it fits in very nicely, but I don't know who it's from. Um, so how far will the use, of English, the use of English as a lingua franca change the nature of ELT? I'll give you about 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> so English as a lingua franca has been discussed a lot, of course, in, in our industry. It is happening in companies, whatever we want to say, it is happening. People aren't worried about passing tests. I work in companies, they've never done a test in 20 years. That's not where we are. So for teachers, we have to start working on this. We've had a couple of really good talks about this this week, in fact. If we claim that it's about getting the job done and intelligibility, then that's our focus in the classroom as well. We shouldn't be worrying about small little details about grammar and third person singular and, and stuff like that. Otherwise, we can't claim to be agreeing with the whole English as a lingua franca idea. If we want to be English as a lingua franca in the workplace, we have to start bringing it into the classrooms a lot more. In my experience, it's actually very easy. You come in, you explain why you're doing it this way, and corporate learners, people in the workplace, fully understand why we're, fo we're not going into grammar and vocabulary and all the traditional stuff. It's not difficult to do if you can persuade them. Thank you. Exactly. you did that very succinctly. I think it's going to be a very long answer because it's such a, a, there's a lot in the topic. So the poll question then is a very long one. How likely is it that you will have interacted with a device like Pepper within the next five to ten years? Uh, as I said, it's simple. You've got the, you get out your device. It's app.meet.ps. Evan, you can vote now or you can vote later on. Have you got it? Yeah. Let's yeah. find out if it works. And I'll reiterate that we, did, we are keeping these polls open so you can vote at any time. Whoa, 54% say very likely. Quite likely, so down to 18% there. So if you can't vote now or uh, if you want to do it later, as I say, we'll keep the poll open. We'll close it sometime next week and then we'll tell you what the result was. Our third speaker then is all the way from Uruguay. It's Mercedes. I always forget Viola. 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 So I do apologise. I know you told me just before we started. Don't oh, worry. One ear out the other. Um, so Mercedes, um, also a BSIG member, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Of course. All right. Yeah. Also, uh, Mercedes, <laughs> of course, a BSIG member. We planned that badly, didn't we? Um, is an international speaker. Her, um, her specialism uh, curriculum assessment and inclusivity. And she's going to talk to us about the changing attitudes and learning habits of future students. Okay. Thank you for being here. We are all in education. We, English teachers, materials writers, trainers, managers, publishers, we are all educators. And English is very important. We all know how English is now the lingua franca of this 21st century global world. And we have a beautiful responsibility in our hands because we are 
educating the future generation of parents, of policy makers, of decision makers. So we can influence the future. We all are change agents. So we have to think about what future do we want? The future is always in the making, so it's unpredictable. But there are some mega trends that are affecting, are influencing this future generation of learners, but also education and learners and future generation of learners can influence these mega trends. So we have to think about the future because it has already started. Um, learners in general and learners of English need to make sense of this world in order to be able to design more sustainable and brighter futures for all. So these are some of the mega trends that are happening in this ambivalent world. We have global and local. Societies are more connected than ever, but also more divided and polarized. And whatever that is done locally affects globally and vice versa. So we have to act with responsibility because we are all interconnected. We have information overload, fake news. Not only there's no time to process all the information that is out there, but also it's very difficult because it's full of fake clues or partial realities. Affluence, scarcity. Some groups are monopolizing the benefits of globalization. 1% of the richest people owns half the wealth of the population. While we still have people who don't have enough food, no access to health services, and no access to education. We have connectivity and isolation. Among heavy users of social media and screens, especially young people, loneliness is often extreme. Rates of anxiety and depression have increased dramatically. And while we are talking about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning as we're talking, we have six out of 10 children and teenagers of primary and lower secondary age who do not achieve minimal levels of proficiency in reading or math. And we are traveling to space. We are talking about space tourism, but at the same time, we are destroying, completely destroying our planet. So these are some of the challenges our learners and future learners need to face. And we, that we are in education, we need to address those challenges with them. Remember, we are change agents. So what do I see for the future? What, are, what is the future of learner habits? What are the habits of this next generation? These are my wishes or my dreams. What do I see? I see learners that are collaborating with others. I see learners that are discovering how they learn and how to learn with and from others that are familiar with artificial intelligence and enhanced technologies, learning with them and creating new knowledge because they will have to reinvent themselves many times. Learners that sometimes succeed but many times fail because they will have to learn from these failures to become resilient. Learners that are making sense of all these mega trends, they will have to critically select all the information that is out there in order to create a picture of the world and act on that. Learners that are working in collaboration, in diverse groups, different age groups, different cultures, different ethnic groups, different abilities and disabilities. They will rely on the wealth of diversity to find creative solutions for all those challenges they have to face. And I see learners that can breathe, learners with time, time to reflect, time to think, 
Time to share. Time to doubt. Time to research. Time to change. Time to live. Brave learners that accept that they don't have all the answers, but are willing to try new things. And these are the attitudes of next generation of learners, as I see it. But I would like to finish by sharing with you something, a photograph I took a couple of days ago at the Museum of Liverpool while I visited an exhibition, a Shoko Ono and John Lennon exhibition. A dream you dream alone is only a dream. And a dream you dream together is a reality. So thank you. I stick to time. <laughs> um, OK, let's go for another difficult question, which I'll give you little time to answer. Um, you kind of talked about different students, the global, the local, the haves and the haves nots. And in one of the, vi one of the clips of the videos at the beginning, uh, one of the speakers was talking about dealing with the people that we don't usually get to. He actually mentioned radio as the way forward. So why, what might be, how might ELT deal with these low resource countries and these um, areas that are developing in the, in the future direction? Well, actually, I think that we teachers and we English professionals are very resourceful. So we can rely of, on a lot of the wealth that we have, so, but we need to share with other teachers if we don't have access to other resources. We also, our students are great resources. So I think there is a lot that we can do with very simple things. Uh, of course, it would be better if we could have access to more resources, but if we don't, we need to rely on one another and, and the students. It's actually a theme on the Twitter discussion at the moment, which kind of started when, uh, from after uh, Catherine's talk, is how uh, the students, how do students, we say the students are the resources, but how do the students become the resources? Uh, which I think is not a question about for now, but yeah. we'll go beyond, as, as I keep saying, we're going to continue beyond uh, this talk on stage, but that, I think that's one of the directions the discussion yeah. will go in. But we are uh, running out of time, and people do have trains to catch. But sitting, uh, oh no, we forgot the poll. <gasps> Forgetting everything. So this one, which of Mercedes points is the most important? Meet, app, meet, PS, Mercedes. Got it? Okay. Still awake? Got it, there we go. Oh, let's work, oh, there we go. There. <laughs> oh, I need to vote to start the poll. <laughs> oh, no, I can't vote. Oh, broken it. We'll have, to keep, we'll have to keep Mercedes a secret for the time being. <laughs> they're all important. They're all important, great. <laughs> if you vote, it will show, but unfortunately, I need to vote to be able to click, click the poll up. I'll do it in a moment. All right, so he's been sat there very patiently yeah. uh, for the last 40 odd minutes. So let's turn over to our last speaker. <laughs> I don't even need to introduce you for you to get a round of applause. That's brilliant. <laughs> so <laughs> Amal, Amal Padward is the director at the Centre for English Education at Embaker University in Delhi and is the secretary of the Ainet Association of English Teachers. And he's, uh, he's, he's great because he's deliberately wanted to go last so you could listen to the other three and pick up the baton and weave it all into the future role of the teacher. So our last speaker this morning, Amal. Uh, I, I would like to thank uh, the IITFL, British Council, and the Hornby Trust as I stand here as the very last speaker of the conference. Uh, I'm going to make some wild speculations about the teacher of the future, the English teacher of the future. But I'm not thinking of a very far away future. I'm trying to imagine a future of, let's say, 25 years hence. And I would like to begin by reminding that the kind of places that Evan referred to are just the small islands on the ELT planet. And the massive mainlands are the primary and secondary education in probably almost all countries of the world where the government and the state ministries of education are the biggest players, and where millions of learners are learning and thousands of teachers are teaching. And it is in this context that I am making my speculations. And I believe that 
this is the kind of image I have of a future teacher or partly already uh, a current teacher. There are certain messages that I would deliberately try to convey through this image. Well, there are apprehensions that machines might take over teaching or English might run out of favor and there won't be any jobs for English teachers in 25 years time. I completely disagree and I'm absolutely confident that there will be lots of jobs still left for us. The English teacher will still be needed in large numbers. And more importantly, the teacher will be a human being, not a robot. Though robots might come in some classrooms which can afford them, but I believe always as an add-on tool or an assistant to the teacher, the human being from the classroom won't go away. And that teacher will still be the central figure in the classroom. But I believe that the future scenario of English language teaching will be very heavily dominated by non-native speakers, teaching all kinds of varieties of English in different parts of the world, appropriated according to the local needs and interest and even local culture. And this teacher will be multitasking, multi-skilled, dependent on technology, but also exploiting technology to much greater advantage. And this teacher will show more initiative, more volunteerism in her own growth, in her own development. One important change that has already begun to happen, and I think it will pick up more steam in course of time, is the teacher won't be just, the English teacher won't be just the English teacher. I think gone are already the days when we were very happily teaching vocabulary, grammar, uh, some letters writing and essay writing, and that's all. Today, and even more strongly tomorrow, the English teacher will be expected not only to teach English language, but also soft skills, critical thinking, uh, problem solving, teamwork, collaboration, what not. In many contexts, it's really a puzzle why all this burden should fall on the shoulders of the English teacher alone. Why not any other teacher? But that's a common trend in many cases which is becoming stronger. And to put it in short, English teacher will be expected to make the kid smart. One of the key challenges in future will be dealing with the new learner who is getting younger, who is a digital native, and who is moving online more and more, which means at least one important implication of that is the teacher won't have any monopoly or dominance in the classroom as the chief source of knowledge or information. The teacher may have to compete. I mean, that depends on the perspective the teacher takes the teacher may compete with alternative sources of information and knowledge and learning in the classroom that students will be using, or the teacher may develop some synergy with those sources. But to move from a, compete, a competing perspective to a synergetic perspective will be a great challenge. In, this, in these massive mainlands of ELT, it's very, very likely that in most cases, English is an aspirational language. English will be, English is a prestige language. Parents, head teachers, administrators, ministries, society have lots and lots of expectations from the learner's English competence. And teachers will have to deal with, to live under these pressures and I'm, I don't, see those pressures going away in another 20 years time. And at the same time, the teachers will have to keep themselves updated on both the sides, the ELT theory and practice and the extremely rapid developments in technology in general. So to end, I would also like to point out that some of the problems that are dogging 
uh, ALT at the moment will continue, even in future. I don't see uh, them going away in another 25 years' time. Uh, problems of teacher shortage, problems of teacher quality, problems of teacher proficiency, which is a typical problem for English teachers, those problems are going to stay. But there is some good news as well. United Nations recently set up what it calls the International Task Force on Teachers for Education. And they, this task force has the mandate to address two crucial issues of teacher quality and teacher quantity uh, until 2030. According to their estimates, 69 million teachers will be required by 2030. And nearly half of them will be English teachers, and many more teaching through English. How to cater to this shortage is a huge global challenge. And in terms of teacher quality, they, uh, they highlight three key terms. And you can see in the bracket, I have just used the abbreviations for them. So teacher quality is conceptualized in terms of qualified, empowered, and motivated. How we ensure that teachers are qualified, empowered, and motivated, the future teacher, the teacher we want for the future that we want. I, will, I would like to end with some good news. I believe that the teacher of the future, the English teacher of the future, is likely to be more autonomous. A lot of her learning will be self-directed and she will be much less dependent on state provision. And all of this because a lot of technological resources will be available to her. In many cases, teachers will continue to learn and develop, not because the state is providing anything, but maybe often in spite of the state provision. And I believe that's good news. Thank you very much. It's reassuring that you still think there'll be teachers. That's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, qu the question um, came, and I, I, we've chosen this question because I think it fits into something that Lindsay was talking about this morning as well. This idea that, uh, and you mentioned that there'll be more online, etc. Do you think that actually teachers moving to teach online could lead to a de-skilling of teachers? Uh, de-skilling in the sense of whatever teachers have been doing in classroom face to face. And, and I think the question setter was also saying that it would make teaching possible via script, that, that there would be no, that the teacher wouldn't need as many skills and as many classroom skills because it's just over video. I think that's what they were asking. Uh, I, I agree with that um, statement partially because, of course, when you stop teaching in a face-to-face -face conventional classroom, you are definitely going to lose some skills and you may learn some other skills as you become an online teacher. But I. Probably I'm an old-fashioned teacher, but I do believe that we would be losing the very spirit of teaching if we are not teaching someone face-to-face. -face. Fair enough. Yeah. And uh, your poll is there. The future of the English teacher won't be teaching just English. I'm going to leave the poll up. I'm aware that time is, is catching us up, which you'll be relieved to know panel means they can't ask you any more questions. Um, so I'll leave the poll up and, and go to it at, at a, um, in, in a moment. I, as I said uh, at the beginning, we want this to be the start of an ongoing dialogue over the next year up to next conference. Thank you to all the people on Twitter that have, uh, have been um, tweeting in uh, comments, discussion questions, uh, and so on. And we will honestly look at them, get back to them, and, and follow them up. Let's, uh, are people voting with Anna? Let's see how they're doing. So these, what you've heard are four people's predictions, ideas, fears, wishes uh, for the future. 97% of people agree they won't just be teaching English. That's quite a strong uh, way forward. So what you've heard are these wishes, ideas, and hopes. What we wanted to do with this uh, closing plenary is give you, is to bring together threads from the conference and give you things to think about on your journey home. The future, of course, can't really be predicted. We don't know what the future direction of VLT 
uh, will be, but there are many aphorisms that say that change is inevitable. Or perhaps in 21st vernacular, it would be put like that. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, I believe Wikipedia told me, said the best way to uh, predict the future is to change it yourself. And what we, of course, what we have seen over conference are teachers presenting ideas, workshops, sessions that all of us can take on board, put into our practice, and all of those steps will change the future direction of ELT. The future does come from the past and present, and one of the things we try to do is respect the final plenary with our traditions today. We began with a video of the photos uh, from conference, which is a tradition that kind of dropped when we came back. And I think it's fair, therefore, as I say thank you to our speakers, just to put a bit of poetry on the screen. Okay. So thank you very much for uh, uh, joining in our interactions. But most of all, thank you to our great panel. I'm going to hand over to, uh, um, where is he, Harry, to close the conference. But please, could you give our speakers a great round of applause? Yeah. Go for it, Harry. Thank you. And here we are after four intense days of interaction, reflection, and hopefully socialization. Thank you so much for coming to ITEFL 2019. I want to thank uh, our sponsors here, without whom parts of this event couldn't financially happen at all. Thank you so much to our sponsors. I would also like to thank our trustees and all the volunteers, ITFL volunteers. Can we see some of our volunteers in the room, please? Can you just raise your hand or stand up? <laughs> Volunteering is a culture that ITFL is really proud of. And we are grateful that you've made everything here possible. Thanks also to our head office staff. And I want to say a special thank you to Alison, who's organized 20 conferences already for ITFL. Thank you so much, Alison. And a big thank you to every delegate who traveled all the way to come to this conference in Liverpool. We have delegates from over 100 countries at this year's conference. Isn't that great? And, and I've really met some wonderful people from all around the world, from Russia, from Thailand, all the way also down and up from South Africa. Thank you for coming. And um, next, well, one last announcement before we go. Don't forget to collect any items that you might have left in the club room before you go, please. And we will be back sometimes next year. Last year, for those of you who were at the conference or who watched it online, I was closing this event with Margit, our past, immediate past president. This year, I'm standing alone, but I wanted to say a big thank you to Margit for the hard work she's put and her dedication into this association. Her work would always be remembered, and she's continued to support us even while she's recovering. So thank you to Margit, and can we give her a hand of applause, please? So we'll be seeing you again from the 18th to the 21st of April 2020 in Manchester. And there we come to the end of ITFL Liverpool 2019. Safe journey back to your various destinations. Goodbye.